Hello, ghost schools and goblins. My name is TV Sky, and here's a question I haven't had an opportunity to ask for a while. What's the deal with Callista? Now, um, Callista recently received herself a little bit of a lore update. Not a huge one. Seems like it's more of a cleanup pass. I it feels a lot like Riot are doing a lot of cleanup on the Shadow Isles region. Maybe in preparation for a new champion, maybe in preparation for some kind of a lore event, who's to say? Or maybe just because they like doing a little bit of narrative cleanup on their universe. That's like a perfectly sensible thing to do when you have a massive universe with a bunch of characters that you need to keep straight. Anyway, they've been doing a little bit of cleanup. They seem to be trying to smoothen out the exact specifications of who the ruined king is, what happened when the Blessed Isles were turned into the Shadow Isles, whose fault it was, and like what the sequence of event was that went on there. And in the process of that, Callista and Hecarim both have received uh, minor lore updates. I think maybe one of the other ones as well. Maybe Thresh got something. I'm not sure. Doesn't matter for the per for the purposes of this video, though, because we're going to be looking at Callista's base lore, like the, the sort of the, the basic concept of the character, the short story that's been released alongside her, and then we're going to look at her character design and draw a little bit of a commentary on whether her character design does what it needs to do, whether it communicates the kind of character that she's supposed to be and uh, all that good stuff stuff. So, Callista, the Spear of the Vengeance. Her story uh, in broad, simplified strokes goes something like this. Callista was like a super good, great general who served the king of an empire that none now recall. That is the empire of the ruined king, who once upon a time was not ruined and was actually like a good king, apparently. Uh, unfortunately, one day someone tries to murder the king because I guess he's not super good to everybody. And the dagger, the poisoned dagger that was meant for the king, accidentally hit his wife instead. The queen got hit. It was a poison dagger, and it was like a super powerful poison, so it's really bad. And the king is like, that's my wife. I'm going to be very, very sad now unless someone can, you know, make her not die anymore. So Callista sets out in search of a cure. She's like, okay, I'll just I'll see all of the doctors all the scholars, all the hermits, all of the, the people who know stuff about medicine, I'll go and see them, and maybe someone can fix the poison. It takes a while, because it turns out that poison is really bad. Now, while Callista is gone, this f new fellow, this is a very good horse rider guy called Hecarim, takes over the place of the king's right-hand man, which is a thing that's probably going to turn out fine, and nothing could possibly go wrong with that. Anyway, Callista pretty much figures out that nobody knows how to fix, fix this damn poison, because it's too powerful, except Maybe on this super legendary island place called the Blessed Isles, they have some kind of super magic that can maybe do the poison curing that she needs. Callista manages to make her way out there after a very long journey and figures out, hey, they have this waters of life thing that can cure absolutely anything. Excellent. I'll go back home and tell them all about it. Hey, my king, I have found the perfect cure to the po- Oh, your wife is dead already, I see. Okay, that's not so great. See, her, the king's wife has died in Callista's absence. And Hecarim has taken over the duties of advising the king what to do about that. And it turns out what Hecarim wants to do is invade everybody and kill everything. Not a super great situation, so Callista returns home and is like, Yeah, I found these waters of life, but they can't. she needs to be alive for those things to work, so I'm afraid we can't really save your wife, sir, I'm sorry. The king, not being in an especially good frame of mind, throws her directly into prison and demands that basically that she lead him to find um, the ma waters of life and all the magic in the world because he'll have his wife back. Ah, he's he's all freaked out because his wife is dead, which, you know, it's, it's a bad time in a person's life, but I feel like people have gotten over worse than that. Anyway, Hecarim comes to Callista and is like, hey, Callista, you know, I mean, everything went bad while you were here. I tried to stop it. You know, me, me at Culpa, I couldn't really stop him, but, you know, maybe if we go to the Blessed Isles, and we just let the king talk to these sages himself. He'll be like, oh, okay, I see, I get it. It doesn't work if she's dead. Oh, well, uh, that, I was being unreasonable. I'm sorry. Maybe then he'll calm down. And Callista's like, that seems legit. And so they, he, she leads her king and his many, many ships and all of Hecarim's legions to the Blessed Isles. On the Blessed Isles, they're like, hi, you guys all look like you have a lot of war on your mind. And I'm afraid we can't revive the dead because that's a bad idea. Reviving the dead causes problems, you see. Like, for instance, there will be evil phantoms and stuff. The king isn't really listening to this. He's like, okay, murder every single one of them until they revive my wife. And Callista's like, I don't think I'm going to do that. That sounds like a bad idea. And Hecarim 
stabs her directly in the back. Just spear directly through the back, and his entire Iron Order also spears through her back, sees her at the Ides of March up in here. So Callista's dead. The Iron Order, which is Hecarim's legion, just starts killing absolutely bloody everybody. And uh, then Callista sort of passes out and doesn't know what happens. What happens in the background is that the ruined king... I'm not sure if that's 100% still the, the lore right now, but the lore used to be, certainly, that the ruined king casts a spell that is supposed to either revive his wife or jo have him join her in death. But unfortunately, a whole lot of things go wrong with that. And instead of just, like, affecting the king and his wife, it affects literally absolutely everybody. It twists the entire Shadow Isles into undead land where everything sucks and everything is bad forever. Everyone's undead and everyone's a ghost and everyone kills everything they see all the time over and over again forever in a twisted mockery of life. You know the drill. Callista, for her part, is very much aware that she has been betrayed and she's pretty pissed about that, understandably. And eventually that resentment, that hatred, that need for vengeance transforms her into a revenge spirit called the Spear of Vengeance, whereby she travels around the world to people who summon her in a plea for vengeance, and she grants them her power in return for them becoming part of her as the Spear of Vengeance. So she's essentially turning into this kind of gestalt entity of multiple spirits that are sort of all fused and subsumed into Callista's form, all of them driven by an intense and insane need for vengeance, even if Callista herself, her own mind, her own consciousness, is fading away. Like, the person that once was Callista isn't really who Callista is anymore, because she's so full of just vengeance and hate and Shadow Isles magic at this point. There's not a lot of her left. So, Callista has a couple of short stories associated with her. This one's called Invocation, and it essentially lays out how Callista works as an entity in the League of Legends universe. We have a sword wife, a warrior woman whose home and whose family has just been burned down and slaughtered and everything's pretty bad. She has lost absolutely everything and all she has left is a lust for vengeance. So she casts a spell or rather she invokes a ritual, specifically uh, hammering a set of nails through an effigy of the man who murdered her family, naming him her betrayer, and promising her soul to Callista in return for vengeance. Callista shows up. She, like, uh, the sword wife kills herself with one of Callista's spears, becomes a shade, joins Callista, and then presumably they go out to murder whoever the guy was that killed the sword wife's husband and family. And that's basically how Callista works nowadays, is that she can leave the Shadow Isles, apparently, when she is summoned by a mortal somewhere who has a sufficiently powerful need for revenge who will invoke a ritual that can call on her from beyond the Shadow Isles to help them enact a revenge around the world. The price of that revenge, though, is that you give up your soul. You give up your afterlife, you give up your opportunity to ever be free again, and you will haunt the world forever as a spirit of vengeance, or as part of the Spear of Vengeance. There's also this poem associated um, with Callista, which is uh, quite a lovely poem, actually. I recommend that people read it, but it's sort of not super relevant. It's essentially a sort of um, long-form poem speaking, working as a kind of morality tale. The Princeling's Lament details the story of a prince who is like, Oh no, my wife is dead. I'm gonna go to the Shadow Isles and see if I can't find some secret to make, maybe bringing her back and making her immortal. And then throughout the poem, it's slowly revealed through interactions with the various ghosts and monsters that haunt the Shadow Isles, including Yorick, uh, Thresh, Callista, and I think Hecarim is there as well, that the prince was not actually sad about his wife. He murdered his own wife and only went to the Shadow Isles with his wife's death as an excuse because he was seeking glory for himself. And it ends with this, this sort of standard moralistic thing of heed his, this fate and learn it well shun the isles where the dead still dwell seek ye all the things to cherish and pass the years and life and time well spent a f life full lift a soul content and know you are all doomed to perish it's essentially a cautionary tale about the dangers of arrogance using the denizens of the shadow isles as a kind of boogeyman um in what seemed to be a piece of folklore uh, from the general League of Legends universe. I quite like this, because like when you have a place like the Shadow Isles, inevitably, obviously, parents are going to be telling their children, well, if you don't eat your vegetables and be good, then I'm turning down some volume on my computer for a sec. Uh, then Hecarim, the big bad beast, will come and eat you for not eating your vegetables and stuff. That's inevitably going to happen. I like that there's this attempt to 
integrate the Shadow Isles into the general culture of the League of Legends universe. Now, as we've discussed many, many times before, those attempts to create a wider culture of the League of Legends universe always kind of fall short in the sense that we don't have a wider narrative of the League of Legends universe. Like, we don't have a TV series, we don't have any movies, we don't have any books yet. There's a Lux novel set, a uh, novella set to come out sometime soon. As like, we don't really have any grand narratives about the League of Legends universe where a culture like this can be properly established, but these are the kinds of um, building blocks with which you can create such a culture once you have an actual longer coherent narrative within which to do it. Okay, so that's Callista's story. She was a great general warrior queen, uh, warrior lady, woman who, leader of men, powerful, loyal, honorable. She was betrayed and that betrayal has turned her into something absolutely horrible. So how does her character design stack up to that? Well, pretty well, actually. Callista is one of the early experiments that Riot did in trying to create a somewhat different form factor for female characters in League of Legends. Now, if you've played League of Legends for any amount of time, you will be familiar with, like, the tendency of a lot of League of Legends lady characters to, like, have very similar body types, big, like, proper boobies and wide hips and thighs and stuff, which is not bad on its own. Like, it's fine that they are there, but they did begin to dominate the game for quite a long while, and Riot, for a time at least, had a determination, okay, let's try and... Let's have that, but then let's also have some other things, like, for instance, a woman who's not all, you know, tits and ass, and maybe a woman who looks like Talia, and maybe Ilawi, who has some muscles or something. Let's try something very slightly different for a while, and they seem to have kind of stopped doing that now, but for a time they tried, and Callista was one of their experiments. And she is actually a fairly well-executed experiment, because unlike a lot of her League of Legends uh, sister champions, she has... a uh, slightly different expression of the physique. Now, Callista is by no means ugly in the sense that, like, she's perfectly symmetrical, she's well in shape, she is pleasingly shaped, she doesn't really have any, um, like, she's not covered in sores or wounds or battle scars or anything that's sort of off-putting like that. She would, if she wasn't blue and stabbed with ghost spears, be a perfectly attractive lady. But she's also extremely... Not skinny so much as she's very bony. She's very, she's emaciated. She's kind of, uh, she's got these sunken in cheeks. She's got these very, um, you know, bony, skinny arms. It's much more apparent, in fact, on her character model. So let's use that one. Like, she doesn't look, you know, great. <laughs> um, but you can see that on her character model, there's much more emphasis on her bones, on like so, sort of the knuckliness, the wiriness of her physique. And rather than being a focus on fullness and softness, she looks kind of hard and unpleasant in her physique, which is a nice alternate expression of femininity in League of Legends. Like, because this is a version of femininity, it's just not the one that League of Legends has most of. So in that sense, I think her, her character design is at least visually distinct from most of the other characters. And that distinctness also has a thematic purpose when it comes to Callista's character, because, of course... She's undead. She is a ghost. She's not a skeleton, but she has a skeletal physique. She looks like something all of the life has been sucked out of, essentially, which is appropriate for a character like that. And there's something clever going on with a cu cu uh, cuirass. Curious? I can never remember how to pronounce the name. Her chest plate, her armor, in that the design of the armor, and it's a little hard to see because these little things are interfering with it, but when you look at, let's see if we can zoom in. When you look at the way her armor is designed, it essentially looks like a ribcage. You can see how the um, the little lines across the midsection and indeed the way that the, the uh, chest plate is designed, even though it has boob plate, which yes, is always one of my pet peeves, it's designed to essentially mimic the shape of a human ribcage. It essentially makes her look even more skeletal, which is like, this is the kind of design I really like when you can make one design element serve multiple purposes, because there are multiple purposes going on here. Callista is a female character, and the designers who were creating her clearly felt that it was important that we know that she is female, which is why they gave her boob plates, which are a dumb feature, but the function of a boob plate in a character design is to say, hey, this character has b breasts. That's what she's got underneath the armor. There's there's breasts down there. You can't see them normally, but we put breasts on the chest plate so you can see that she has breasts, right? It's a, it's a signifier of femininity, typically, in character design. Um, and 
that's like one purpose of it is to em is to emphasize that Callista is female. She's feminine. She has breasts. She's she's a lady girl. But also, it serves the purpose of making her look even more bony, even more skeletal, even more emaciated, even more sunken into herself, which is a very good use, uh, like double use of a design feature. Now, personally, I feel like in terms of from, from a narrative perspective, I would kind of have liked it if turning into the spirit of vengeance had taken away her femininity, like if it had made her essentially genderless, because like... Callista in life was a woman, specifically a woman, and she actually has a, a romantic interest who was revealed in one of the other stories. We don't get into that one here because it's fairly new and it's not really like it influences much rest of it. But anyway, Callista was a woman in life, but as she turns more and more and more into the Spear of Vengeance, the person she was falls away and everything that was her is replaced with just the lust for vengeance. And like there's this theme of loss of identity. And one of the ways you could show that would be by taking away all the markers that make her, you know, a specific human being, like the specific identity markers like gender, for example. Like they've already taken away the skin color. Like she's blue, which is not associated with any human spe uh, race that I'm aware of. They've taken away that. They have taken away um, uh, all the color from her armor, by the way. Which is another thing, like, her armor was probably not all brown on brown with brown and some brown accents on brown. Once upon a time, it probably had some color, but that's been sort of sapped away by rust and by the ravages of time. So that she's become this sort of... a, a thing of no nation. A thing of no particular affiliation. She just wears this armor that looks really old, like she's from some ancient Roman army, but it doesn't look like anything. Um, which is one of the points that's brought up in um, the short story, uh, with the... With the sword wife is one of the thing, one of the impressions that the sword wife gets when the ancient spirit of spirit of vengeance stands before her, filling her the doorway. The otherworldly being was clad in archaic armor, her flesh translucent and glowing with spectral unlight. Black mist coiled round her like a living shroud. Right, so it's archaic armor. What nation is it? No one remembers. Like that part of who she was, her identity as a servant of this nation is gone. It's been taken from her, along with absolutely everything else. So for me, that would have been more interesting than keeping the gender marker, but I also understand from a design perspective, if you want the audience to be sure that the character is female, there's rarely a symbol that is more typically associated with being female than having breasts. So there you go. <clears throat> I have nitpicks about it, but, you know, I, from a design perspective, I can understand why, why they would do it. Uh, a couple of other design uh, things about her. Callista is a very agile character. She jumps around the field a lot. She's got a lot of agility. She's got a lot of movement to her. She's got her hopping thing that she does uh, with with her auto attacks. To that end, they've made two sensible decisions about her. Now, on the one hand, it would have been smart to give her some actual armor on her legs because, like, who the hell goes to war while having their thighs exposed to, to the enemy? Like, it's weird. But in this instance, that part of it, the, and the same reason why her arms are bare, is to emphasize what kinds of movements, what kinds of behaviors she engages in, which is also part of the reason why her legs are so muscular, like you can see all the muscle definition on her legs, is because she jumps around a lot, she has that very agile, jumpy back and forth style, which is also part of the point of um, having, you know, the long hair and the flowing plume thing that extends from her helmet, and the loose-fitting sort of uh, gladiatorial skirt that she's got going on there. Part of that is, all of that is to communicate a lightness and a flow of, of her being like that. She has this this flowing motion from one side to the other, uh, where if she had been a much bulkier, much more tanky character, normally you would not put, at least from a from a, a movement design perspective, you would not put a whole bunch of flowing capes and stuff and, and, and like uh, light details like that on the character because it makes them look too agile when you want them to look big and bulky and immovable. So therefore, on Callista here, they're all meant to emphasize her speed and her agility. And they do a good job of doing that from a visual perspective. The thing you sacrifice for that is, again, the accuracy of the outfit. Like, in, in, in terms of, yeah, she would still have, like, some chainmail on or something, though, right? Like, she would still have some thick leather pants. Or, like, she could still move if she had, some, like, some thick defensive leather pants or something. But you sacrifice that, and you also sacrifice boots, by the way, which is another thing. Her feet are um, exposed because, again, she's a character with a lot of footwork going on. So visually signifying what kind of character she is while sacrificing the accuracy, which is called stylization. And it's the difference between, like, hyper-realistic stuff and fantasy stuff like League of Legends. 
there's other there's one other detail about Callista that I sort of want to nitpick. I think it's an absolutely brilliant idea that Callista, like Callista has the ability to throw spears into the enemy and rend them, like pull them out of them. I think it's thematically brilliant that she is also permanently impaled by spears. Like she's permanently got impalement by spears going on. She uses one of those spears as the spear of vengeance. Like she throws it down, whoever picks it up becomes her partner, yada, yada, yada. All of that is really nicely done. I would have liked it to be a little bit more obvious on her character model though that she has been brutally murdered. Like, cause that, that's, that's the main thing that happened to her to turn her into what she is, is Hecarim and like 50 people hacked her to pieces. Like they stabbed her many, 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 many times. And having the ghost spears there to represent that is fine. But in, in terms of Callista being this ravaged, destroyed, betrayed, warrior who's like who's clawed herself back from oblivion to take revenge on the people who destroyed her i think you could do a lot more in terms of having her armor be ruined in terms of having her like you, you've got these tattered scraps of cloth and you've got the armor that looks kind of tarnished but i think you could go a lot harder on like i would like to have seen her for instance um have part of her body eaten away like, instead of just making her bony, have actual bone show through. Like, maybe some of the flesh on her arm has been hacked off and you've got this ugly wound that shows bone underneath. But she still drags on because part of the point of her is that she's carrying on in spite of being horribly, horribly wounded. Like, that's part of that's part of her concept. You could go a lot harder on that. You could have more ruined, destroyed armor. You could have more explicit wounds. You could even, like, if you... I, I know for censorship reasons, probably this is not possible, but I would have liked to see something like an actual open, bleeding wound. Like, if Callista, every, everywhere she walks, was trailing blood after herself from the wounds on her back because those wounds will never close which is the essence of, of, of uh, having a thirst for vengeance and being betrayed, is that the wounds don't heal. The only way you know how to, how to stop the pain of the betrayal is by taking vengeance because the wounds will not heal. Crawling in my skin, yada, yada, yada. <clears throat> and that would also, I feel, tie in better with the idea of her as a ghost, as a haunting ghost, um, in terms of at least the ghost stories that I know oftentimes feature like headless ghosts or specters that like have these terrible wounds and they're dripping with blood and like I was murdered in life ah, that kind of thing which is something like I feel like they could have gone a lot harder on that with Callista for like maybe that's a thing for readability in game like if she's on the rift and she's constantly dripping blood maybe that causes some kind of a problem with when you have bleeding effects on certain spells and stuff like that I don't know maybe there's something there more likely, probably, that particularly Chinese censorship, but certainly overseas censorship, is kind of strict about what kinds of ghostly entities you can show and what levels of gore and blood and stuff you can show. That's probably why, but that's just my final little nitpick. In a full analysis, I really like Callista as a character and as a design. I think she's a really complete character design. I think she's a really good concept that was executed on really, really well. I don't think there's, like, I had a bunch of nitpicks because I always do, but Callista as a whole is a really solidly designed character. Like, there, there's a clear concept, there's a very clear execution, the character design constantly communicates things about who this character is in a clear and concise way, which would have been lovely to see you keep up that discipline with someone like, for instance, Kaisa, right? And just, mm, never, I'll never stop hammering you about that one. But, like, she's really, she's a high watermark in League of Legends character design. Like it's like you're not really in doubt about what kind of the character this is. You're not really in doubt about what she is about. You're not really in doubt about the themes of betrayal and vengeance. You're not really in doubt about the whole ghostly thing. It all works together coherently. And her narrative is really good as well because it relies on a bunch of tropes, but it mixes them in an interesting way and ties it in well to the overarching lore of the Blessed Isles and stuff like that. That all just works really well. So you know what? Good job, right? See? I can be nice. Anyway, if you have enjoyed this video, you should feel very free to hit the like button, subscribe button, bell icon. I don't know. Maybe if they add a new button like two months from now and it's like, please click that one as well. I don't know. YouTube does stuff. Uh, you can also, if you want to, you can help support the channel itself, uh, which happens over on Patreon where you can sign up with a monthly subscription or there's some links down in the description if you just want to give me like a one-time tip to say, hey, that, that was a nice video. You can have a dollar. Good job, then I would also appreciate those, because that 
is how I pay rent and food and w heat and internet and stuff so I don't die. All of that would be nice if you want to do it. Uh, if you can't or if you don't want to, of course, that's completely okay. Just thank you for watching this 25 minute long video about Callista. I greatly appreciate that. If you've not enjoyed the video, congratulations on lasting this far, but uh, there is a dislike button down below that you can click. Be warned, however, that the dislike button may or may not, and I will not take any responsibility for what happens, summon an immortal spirit of vengeance who will insist that you join them in death to haunt the lives of all of those who commit betrayals in life forever. And the trouble with this spirit is like, it's not dangerous, it's not gonna kill you, but it's just gonna hang around and keep being like, hey, do you wanna go avenge some death and stuff? Do you, like this, there's, there's this dude over there who owes someone some money and he hasn't given it back and we could just tote, we could just go and stab him right now. I mean, come on, just, if you pick up like the ghost spear I've left on the ground, we can go and kill him now. And it's like, it's again, it won't hurt you or anything. It's just gonna hang around and it's like, he's gonna be knocking on your door. It's gonna be texting in the middle of the night. Cause you, hey, do you wanna go kill this guy? And it's like, you go, constantly you're gonna have to make up excuses about, well, dude, I'm sorry. I just, I can't today. I've got, I need to do the laundry, and there was like, um, there was this, I heard about this other betrayal in another town, and I've already made plans to go over there and kill the guy, so, you know, maybe, maybe next week it's fine, and it's just gonna be annoying, and then eventually, someday, you're gonna have to come clean and be like, no, I don't actually want to kill anyone, and that's gonna be awkward, because they're gonna block you on Twitter, and you're gonna have to do, like, a whole thing with your Facebook friend groups and stuff like that, and it's just, I mean, if you wanna leave the dislike, it's fine, but I'm just saying, maybe it's not worth it. Thank you very much for watching.